All right, uh, welcome to this uh, second day of uh, Code Rage uh, 7 for C++. Uh, today's Tuesday, December 11th, and it is 6 a.m. in uh, Scotts Valley. Uh, today, we're going to start off with a live presentation, uh, Fire Monkey Wood style. Marco Kentu, our new uh, Delphi product manager, is going to uh, present uh, live uh, Fire Monkey Wood style uh, using C++. Uh, unfortunately, he had not. Uh, he didn't have time to uh, pre-record it, so we're going to do it live. Uh, so it's going to be all C++ uh, the entire session. In, and he's remote from uh, from Italy. In the event of an internet breakdown, which I'm uh, praying that we're not going to have, we do have um, a Delphi version of the uh, talk uh, pre-recorded, uh, but we will only use that uh, if. Marco uh, falls off the internet for some reason, or if we do. So anyway, uh, with that, um, I'm proud to introduce, uh, happy to introduce Marco Cantu, uh, Delphi Park Manager. He's going to do C++ Fire Monkey Wood style. Take it away. Hi. Um, so you okay. should uh, uh, change presenter to yourself. Do you want me to do that, or do you want to do it? Uh, I can do it. Okay. I think. Uh, yep. There we go. And then uh, share your screen. Screen of main monitor. Oh. Um, it will give you a blinky outline of the border and it will help you select which one to share. Okay. Mm. Oh, there we go. I see your slide. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I see it myself, but there's a little bit of a, of a delay. So, okay, let's get this started. Let's see how it works. Um, okay, so thanks for attending to this uh, session, uh, this CodeRage C++ session. The specific topic is FireMonkey with styles, so it's about using styles in uh, FireMonkey. And as we'll see, it's quite a key topic because differently from the recent additions to styles to the VCL, um, in, in FireMonkey, styles are one of the cornerstones of the library. Uh, in the VCL, it's just like a, a graphical feature, but in FireMonkey, it's really a key, um, a key element. Um, so as uh, Anders mentioned, I have joined the market era about a month ago, um, and my role is to be Delphi product manager. I, in the past, I did write uh, books about Delphi. Actually, in the very early days, I wrote books on C++ as well. But my C++ is not really that bad. I had some rough time typing the code live, so I'll avoid that. Um, and while there's still, I will, I'm keeping my blog and my Twitter account, so these are the ways to, to, to reach me uh, anyway. Again, in this session, we're going to focus on using styles in FireMonkey. We'll try to look a little bit of the internal structure of controls. Again, the internal structure of controls and the nature of FireMonkey controls is significantly different from the, the VCL counterpart. We'll look a little bit, not too much details, into the um, controls hierarchy. Time permitting, I'm going, I might be able to show you a couple of uh, custom controls. For those, the code is still Delphi and is not C++, uh, but all of the other demos are, are based on C++. We're go also going to cover a little bit the change to styles in FireMonkey 2. These are actually quite significant, uh, but the thing is that it, they are slightly more complicated, so I'll just try to forget about the FireMonkey 2 styles from the very beginning, focus on what styles are, and then we'll get back to to that other uh, information. So what is a style in FireMonkey? There are many ways of looking into styles. I think the most correct way to look into styles is to consider uh, the relationship between HTML and cascading style sheets. In HTML, all you do is you define the structure, well, let me say in modern HTML, not a classic old-fashioned HTML, in modern HTML, you refer about the structure of, uh, of your page in the HTML itself, but you rarely provide 
information about not only the uh, graphical, like the colors, if something has to be red or blue or whatever, but even some of the behavior, uh, all of the positioning, and some other relevant information is actually moved off to a cascade distance uh, and not bound to the HTML. So everything graphic related, everything user interface related should actually be in the CSS and not in the HTML file. So somehow this is also the case for Fire Monkey. Without styles, you don't get a chance to see a button, I mean, to see the standard controls on the screen. So it's really a foundation. It is what makes Fire Monkey cross-platform because it's not just, again, changing the colors a little bit, but it's much more radical. It's changing the behavior. So when we say, again, button, we're not saying something native to a platform. It's, we're not saying uh, create Windows X call with button uh, window style as it happens on the VCL. We're just saying uh, uh, an, uh, an abstract control that behaves and looks like a button, or what we think is a button. But the, the fact is that buttons look and behave differently on Mac, on Windows, on iOS, on Android, on whatever other platform we want to bring this library to. So the core idea is that the behavior, and not just the colors, it's not colors, it's really the behavior, the fact that when you move over the button, you can highlight, you get a different, a different look and feel, uh, is really bound to uh, styles in Farmonk. Now, there are multiple ways of looking into styles. The m simplest one, but again, it might be a little misleading because it looks like a graphical thing. The simplest one is to look at styles in terms of global styles. So the global styles determine the uh, overall look and feel of the application. The, you can, by default, you get the platform look and feel but what you can do is uh, actually assign a completely custom look and feel to your application, okay? And this is, in pr pr practically, in practical terms, the, the change and the, and the customization of styles happens by using a style book component. So let me get C++ filtering view. This is a simple application we're going to spend a little bit of time with, and it's, it's called Styles 101, and, and it looks a bit odd on the screen. I'm not sure why. Okay. Uh, it's just a bit slow to update, but it should get there. Um, so this application does a few things. It has a stylebook component. So the stylebook component is the component you can use for customizing your styles. Uh, as we'll see in a second, there is an editor attached to the stylebook that lets you change the behavior, uh, change the actual style. Uh, either provide a custom one or change the, uh, or change the existing style. But the simplest thing we can do in terms of style is to see what happens when we change a style dynamically. And this is achieved by changing the file name of the, the, file name, the value of the file name property of the style book. As, you, as soon as you make this change, not only you're assigning a file, but you're actually forcing that file to be loaded into the style book um, and the style to be reflected in your, in your form. The uh, form has a property, the active style book, which is tied to this specific component. So if we run this application, what happens is that we have a chance to uh, hit the uh, load style button and execute the code that I just demonstrated. We can go pick one of the existing styles uh, that ship with the product, and there are uh, a few of them. Uh, let's pick uh, Golden Graffiti as a style. And as I pick this style, what happens is that 
the entire look and feel of my application changes uh, considerably. I mean, it's completely different than what it was before. Uh, we have picked a completely different style for our application. And of course, I can, I, I can keep going and select a bunch of completely different look and feels for my uh, application. But again, this is a bit misleading because it looks really kind of a graphical uh, feature, graphic related feature, while in fact it's much more profound, it's much more radical to uh, the library than, than this. In fact, if we get back to our, star, to our slides, it's not that you can just work on the styles at the global level, you can also work on styles at the individual control. You can change or fine tune or replace completely the style of each individual control or of all of the controls of a given, uh, of a given type. Okay, and each control in FireMonkey has got a property and the property is the style the control is um, um, associated with. If there is no value, then it will pick a default style, which is the class name, but the initial T followed by the word style. So for a T button, the default style is button style. But again, you can change this association. So what we can do actually, and I did this in this application, we can go and pick a different style which in this case is called button custom style style one. We can go pick a different style in the, um, for that component. And as you see, this, the style has, I've modified the style, I'll get to get the details in a second. I've modified the style to have a black background and a yellow uh, caption. Of course, if you need the same style for a different control, you don't need to modify the style for the second control, but you can just hook into that specific style. Or of course, you can also change it to revert it back to the original, to the original value. You can do this at design time, but you can also do this style change at runtime. Depending on the current value, we can toggle the um, value for button custom style, style one or uh, button style. We can pick one of the two values for this style lookup property. Okay, well, not the best code, but gives you an idea. Notice that Again, we have this custom style, and what we can do is to select the component and do edit custom style. And now what happens, that will again open, we'll open the stylebook editor, and we're doing actually this for the first time. This has a bunch of predefined styles that are part of this application, and then there is my specific button, BTN custom style, style one, which is just a name, of course, you could name it any way you like. And again, you can see this is actually uh, the black background and the yellow text. And the yellow is the value of the color for the text property for this, which is one of the sub elements of our button. And similarly, whoops. And similarly, the background has a color uh, connected to it. So you can, oops, so we can customize the look and feel of our uh, button control and then apply this style to one or more controls just by uh, changing the associated style name. This is relevant. I mean, the fact that the button has this sub-element called text this is a native element of FireMonkey, which is different from, or a shape, which is different from a visual component, which is generally a style control. And we'll get to the details in a second. The relevant thing here is that 
this button has an internal text object. And this is the one that has the color. In fact, if we close this form, this designer, and get back to our component, the, the button hasn't got a property for the color. There's no obvious way to change the color of this button. If you want to do it in code, what you have to do is again to go and grab that text element inside the button and change its color. And the way you do it is by calling a specific function that's called find style resource and we can do it for the label, we can do it for the button. We can do find style resource and go grab the specific uh, text sub-element of the control. Notice there is nothing in the control itself saying there is a text sub-element. This is due to the style. Although there are quite a number of controls in FireMonkey that require a text sub-element to behave uh, properly. Okay, and again, so here's how I can grab this sub-element and change colors, change the text, change some of the properties of the uh, of this uh, again elements of the style. And now for the label, this has been changed in FireMonkey 2 in in uh, C++ Builder XC3 because now the label surfaces a color property. But we'll get to that in a second. Okay, and again, I hope the 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 code comparison works. I hope it's good enough C++. Again, I had to brush up my my uh, knowledge of the language a little bit. Uh, I hope it, it, it works okay for you with a better C++ knowledge than I, than I have. Um, okay, so next step is to actually go and see a couple of more things about the role of styles. Oh no, first I have to demonstrate this behavior, um, changing some of the colors to red, uh, changing a style dynamically when we did the style change. And the last thing that I wanted to show you, I'll first show you the behavior and then I'll show you the code behind the scenes, is the ability to use styles or oh, too bad, uh, debug, pen, hand, PNG, okay, I can fix this bug, and yeah, this is happening live, so I have to go grab one file and move it from a folder to another folder, because I did one last minute change, what you should never do with a live session, but that's okay, so just give me a second, and I can grab my, whoops, where is that? Great that I lost a file. Um, wow, wonderful. Um, okay, I'm getting there. Okay, got the file. Sorry for this delay. I need to copy it into here, and hey, now it's working. So now we can add this, uh, the name of, the, of a file and the actual file itself to our list box. Now this demonstrates a very simple thing. List box items can, be, uh, can have sub-elements, so it can be much more sophisticated than they are in the VCL, but that was not actually my goal. My goal is to give you a look at how you can achieve this behavior in two completely different ways. The first way is very traditional. Just have a bunch of um, some code, and in the code I'm creating list box items, text items that are owned by the list box, and images that are owned by the list box as well. So it's all code, it's all there, position, size, everything is just written in code. Very simple, very straightforward. 
the same way you'll use for creating a control, uh, I mean in the VCL, a control at runtime rather than relying on the DFM file. But we can achieve exactly the same behavior in a completely different way. First, we have to open our style book again and go and see for a specific element that I created. It's called, I think, new style. New style one. This is a completely custom style element. And this custom style element has two sub-elements, an image item and a text item. This is the structure. So we have created a, an abstract concept, which is a structure of an image plus some text. And I've given it a name. Now what we can do in code is to create our list box item and then rather than creating the sub-elements for the list box item, we just apply the style to the list box item. So by applying the style, what we get is the two sub-items are actually created. And then we can dynamically assign some of the properties as I did before for the color or the text of the button and labels. The Interesting thing here is really the, the line that's selected. It's the ability to change a style dynamically and the effect is not to change the colors of this list box item or to change the look and feel. But the effect is to create a structure. It's to create some components. Now this might seem a bit strange to you but it ends up working exactly like it works for a form in the VCL. When you create a form in the VCL, you're not saying T button create, T list box create, T whatever create. You are loading a DFM file, and the DFM file has the structure, is a string with the structure of the sub elements. And these objects are going to be created by reading in information from the DFM file. And for example, we can see. A DFM file, or actually a FMX file, but the two are absolutely similar uh, here. So, in Firebank uses the same streaming for forms, and it's something that DEFI and C++ builder developers who have used the VCL should be uh, fully aware of. But then there is something more. If we scroll down a bit, we get to see the style, and the style looks suspiciously similar to the DFM file it, itself. And in fact it is. So what happens when you're creating a sub uh, object and assigning a style to it, what it basically does, it's a little more efficient, but conceptually what it does, it will load a little bit of a DFM file and use it to apply the behavior and create the subcomponents that are required by that object. Exactly like when you're creating a form, you're creating the subcomponents, the components on the form that you're required, you, that you need. So every it's like every component is a form, and every component has an, an internal small DFM file, which is the style assigned to the individual control at a given time. This is extremely powerful. Uh, yes, it might look slow, but there are, there's, there are a lot of optimizations built into the system to at least overcome some of the slowness, but in terms of flexibility, it's extremely powerful. Because now I could give this style to an external designer, he could come up with creative ways to arrange that text item and that image, and then without having to change my source code in any way, I'll ha I can apply the new behavior to my control. So it really helps separating the user interface concerns even in terms of structure of the user interface elements to the actual code that I'm writing. While in the previous version, the, the one with the um, list box that was created directly in code, everything was really hard coded. I mean, position, sizes, dimensions, every, the structure, everything was hard coded. Now we've gone to the ex opposite extreme where basically nothing is hard coded but everything is uh, style based. 
Okay, so now that we have some more understanding of styles and we've looked into this um, styles 101 demo, what I want to go through uh, is to rapidly go through um, a couple of other features related with um, this, this topic. Um, we've seen these steps, changing the colors, sharing a custom style, changing style at runtime, list post style items. So as I mentioned, uh, styles actually changed a little bit in, in FarmMonkey 2. The idea is that styles in FarmMonkey 1 were all uh, vector-based. Now we have both the options of having styles that are vector-based and styles that are bitmap-based. They are also called pixel-perfect styles. What you can basically do is to take the VCL bitmap styles editor and export your style as um, a FarmMonkey style. Now the reason for changing uh, part of the architecture is that if you really want to have full and complete control to the individual pixels of the screen, you really need to go uh, to a bitmap-based solution. Uh, it's very difficult to, with vectors and, and, sh and, and borders and shadows to mimic the exact look and feel of, of buttons. And while users that are on Windows don't really bother too much because on Windows in like the last 20 years we've seen like any form of buttons, every version of Windows, buttons move from rounded corners to uh, angle corners to slightly rounded corners to angle again to even more rounded corners and every, the color change from version to version. So basically everything goes on Windows but when we think about uh, OS X and Mac users, they are more, I mean the platform is more consistent and user expect more consistency and that's even more true for iOS where the path is very consistent and not only users expect more consistency but the guardian of the App Store also expect you to be quite consistent with their, uh, their style. So there are a number of reasons to really be very very close to style. This is also more effective but it's a bit hybrid. You can still use the vector based styles. I mean that you can use both styles at the same time but by default the editors you get in terms of <coughs> in terms of bitmap styles, uh, the editor the styles you get by default, the platform styles are actually bitmap based, and this makes the code like the previous demo a little more difficult to uh, to customize. This also introduces a couple of new features. One of them is this concept of the style settings, and I can actually show this to you if we get back to our uh, standard demo here for this uh, text object. Oh, sorry, uh, that's not true for the label, which is the one that uses the text object. Uh, the label has now got a property which is the font color. Okay, and you can see here uh, in this demo that the font color is set to brown, but if in, in fact it doesn't look like it is working because the uh, label itself is, is gray. Now if I go change the color and say I want to have it whatever this color is, Chuck Rose, it's a green. <coughs> now it's, in fact it did change to green. Now the thing is that there are two things here at stake. Given that labels in general should adapt to your style, like if I pick a style with green background, that label won't show very well. So you generally adopt the style and customize through style. But now you have the ability to do this direct, but there is a property, it's called style settings, and this is somehow resembles the parent properties in the VCL, the parent color, parent font, whatever, in the, in the VCL, because what you can do here is you can tell the component if for these five properties, well, whatever, four plus other, it is the individual property that wins or the style. Okay, so for example we can pick, we can say that the font color comes from the style and then the font will, the, col the label will have the style color and not the specific color which is still set to green that is picked from the component. If I turn this off then the 
individual local setting win. So you can go for local settings or you can go for style settings and turn them off on and off with this with this property. Again, very similar to the parent properties in uh, the VCL. So that was one change um, that's significant <clears throat> in in the in the styles. The other big thing is the introduction of a new internal component it's called T sub image. The idea is that behind a bitmap based style there is one single huge bitmap or a PNG file. And then what happens is that each individual control grabs small bits and pieces of that bitmap and uses those bits and pieces to draw its own structure. Uh, and this is what the TSAP image component um, is for. So let me go ahead and finish by covering some of the um, structures of the VCL, uh, of the FireMonkey library in terms of control architecture. There are basically two branches under T control. One side is primitives. Primitives inherit from T shape. This is the base class. And examples are image, paint box, rectangle, text. And what they basically do, they override the paint function in T control and they paint something on the screen. Uh, in terms of painting, um, so these are called, again, shapes. They use this, they display primitives, they use fill and stroke settings. And these are some of the descendant classes. In terms of painting, I want to show you a very simple uh, painting code and then show you how it can be managed in terms of component. So this is actually my second C++ example. It's a very simple form with a few controls in it. There is a um, paint box and a label. And what I have behind the scenes is painting code. That will just paint onto those controls, just on paint event handlers. And using this application, if we run it, we will obtain a user interface with a bunch of painter controls using gradients, um, rounded corners for the rectangles and there is also some behavior because the button when it press it becomes an opaque transparent uh, button. Okay now this is interesting and again what a, what a shape does is paint itself using this kind of primitives but notice that what you can also do is to pick one of these controls and basically obtain the same effect with no code behind the scenes. This is almost the same identical output but it's obtained by using rectangle components that do paint themselves rather than using, and there is also a path, a triangular path, rather than using the, um, the painting code. So I haven't ported this code from, from Delphi to C++, but basically because there is one line of code, so it's not actually a big deal. Again, this explains some of the internal structure uh, of, well, this explains the fact that rather than painting, you can use the primitive objects. And this is what happens when you use a style control. When you use a style control, what you are basically doing is you are using this sub element, you're using text elements, you're using uh, um, graphical elements, rectangles, border, and also effects, animations, and a bunch of other features that are part of FarmMonkey to create the look and feel of an existing control. And the control itself has no intimate knowledge of the sub elements it's going to have, but what it does, it paints by applying uh, the style. Uh, so again, without the user interface, without the style, it, it's a do-nothing, uh, completely useless um, element. 
So the last demo, and for this last part, I don't have um, a C++ counterpart. It's Delphi code. It's component-driven code, so it's slightly, it, it's a slightly different kind of lower level. So here I have written two components. This is a class. This is a graphic component. It's a class that inherits from T shape, and its core feature is a paint method that does the painting. On the other hand, I have a style control. There's no painting here. There is just an abstract concept of the fact that there is a circle representing this this lead, and this circle is hooked. I mean, the the local field is hooked uh, a flat circle to the element that's provided through the style. Without style, this circle won't show up. Won't even show up. Is doesn't work, has really no behavior, no nothing. It cannot work without having a style. Now the reason that we wait, where is my demo? Oh, this is only the component. I should have opened the group. The reason that here I see something visually for both my shape lad and my style based lad is because I've provided a style in my style book. But if I get here and change this structure completely, for example, I could have a, an object that actually not a circle but is more of an ellipse, and the internal lead is actually off the regular area, whatever, apply and close, that's going to be the look of my component. So I've created something that, just with a very simple change, something that's significantly different in terms of look and feel. I could have replaced this external color with something different. I mean, here, this is all hard-coded. Uh, the user interface, the graphic, the uh, the features are all hard coded, and yes, I can change some of the properties and get the component to repaint directly. Here, I go through an intermediate step, but I can still change some of the properties and get the same kind of repaint or update because I'm applying those properties, in this case, a color, to one of the sub elements that's exposed by the style. So, again, completely different architecture from the VCL based application. Of course, there's nothing like the window control behind the scenes. It's all custom, but again, it's paint through styles, and styles create a lot of flexibility in your um, applications. So that's what I basically wanted to show you, and uh, I hope the fact that, <laughs> that I got this live hasn't, I mean, has come up nicely. Um, uh, and I guess we can open it up for uh, Q&A now. All right. Thank you, uh, Marco. That, I think that worked out great. Yeah, it was a little odd for me because I could see myself with some delay, and uh, at times I was a bit, a bit worried. <laughs> oh, yeah, true. There you go. But you, you did the right thing. You're, you're pausing here and there, so that's good. Uh, so the... Uh, um, it was all good. Um, let's see. We have a couple of questions here. If you have any questions for uh, Marco, feel free to put them in now. Um, do you see the questions? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. So the first one says, when I set a control property at design time to zero, like, for instance, the opacity, and then run the app, it returns to its default value again, which was uh, one. Same goes for style designer in XC2 and XC3. I have never seen this, so have you seen it? No, I haven't uh, noticed that specific that specific thing. Um, opacity. Um, 
He's actually getting other things. He had some issues yesterday, and he had something else. He has another one uh, listed later on, which makes me think that maybe there's something going on on just his machine. He says he created a C++ custom style control in XC3, and then links with runtime packages. Uh, it does not link with runtime packages, and he uh, does not link with dynamic RTL. And when he exits the app, he gets an exception in system.pass. Um, so anyway, um, Achman, if you want to send me an email offline, we can uh, try to figure yeah, out. Yeah, we, we can look into it. It doesn't, I mean, sounds like, what, either a bug or, or some specific uh, issue on... on uh, either that or support. Yeah, I haven't never seen anything like that. I mean, yeah, op opacity is one of the values that has, uh, that doesn't have, like, open... Uh, open flexibility in terms of values. You can only assign. I mean, in FireMonkey, basically there are, I mean, standard values like positions and sizes that are floating point numbers rather than integers, but they behave like you would, you would expect. There are angles that, of course, are zero to 360, and if you put anything over 360, it's like, well, at times it's accepted, at times it's converted back to. Like if you put 370, you might at one point see 10 because that's the actual value. Uh, and then there are percentage, and actually there are a lot of them, and percentage values like the opacity actually are from 0 to 1. And for some values, the 0 to 1 is the legal range. So if you set anything more than 1 or less than 0, you get, well, 1 or 0. But in other situations like the rotation center percentage or other percentage, you can actually, or the, the scaling, you can actually go above, like you can have two, which is like twice as big or twice as, as, as far away. So in some cases, the percentage, but it's not limited from zero to 100% or zero to one, but it, you can go be, below zero or you can go above, above 100%. Uh, in the, some of the code that you showed, uh, we saw a lot of dynamic casts, um, which according to Bjarne, uh, Surstrup is a bit of a no-no, especially in uh, hard real-time systems. Uh, do you see this as a problem when using FireMonkey in critical applications? That's my code, and uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, that learned from, from my own books, but that was... A few more well, a few years ago, more than I would wish to to remember, um, than when when he wrote his first book, than when he was starting with C plus plus. Um, so and and my my C plus plus is very rough, so I'm not sure if what I showed was the best practice or good coding style. I kind of had a hard time convert my Delphi mindset to C plus plus again and get things text things running. So I'm, I'm not at all saying this was a good uh, good coding style. Uh, it's true that there is, I mean, some of it, I mean, conceptually, some of the dynamic cast behavior is part of the VCL and of FireMonkey because at times, um, like when you get this, the, the sender parameter out of a, an event handler, this is a very generic parameter and you might have to cast it back to a much more specific type. Um, so this behavior probably is something that that's required, um, and it's if you need like yeah I mean extreme speed, uh, it, you might have want to consider different approaches, and there are different approaches. I could have hard code like the, the specific components and just have code that was targeting specific component rather than generic code that targets the sender or whatever the sender is. Uh, can styles be manipulated by end users and or new users, uh, or can they just select between built-in styles in a list? In term, if you create styles internally, like when you when you create a style book and you load the style in the style book, you are bundling this. The style becomes part of the DFM. It is still conceptually possible because when you load it in the style book, you get two things. You get um, a property that's called resources, which is just the string list. And then you get a, an object called root, which is basically the in-memory streaming of the stream list. So when you're actually creating objects, you're not loading the, from the stream, but you're just cloning some internal in-memory uh, objects representing the various ed elements because that's much faster. Um, so actually, you can dynamically go add and customize resources, but 
that becomes even more obvious when you're loading an external star. An external star is a file and technically is more or less a DFM or XFM file. So if the end user has a replacement style file, yeah, they can load it and just plug that in rather than what you what you provided. So in theory, it's completely it's completely open. If you want to dynamically let them change some of the style elements, it might be slightly more complicated, but it's nothing. It's totally doable. Uh, I mean, creating and changing styles dynamically is is possible. All right, great. Um... I'm a little bit confused. If T text derives from T shape, why is the one control that doesn't have fill and stroke? There seems to be very little difference between T label and T text. Um, there is very little difference between T label and T text, exactly because a T label by default, and again, you can have different styles for different platforms, but by default, a T label has a very simple style, and the only f element of its style is a T text. So, how is that different? Let me, I can actually show this through uh, a, a demo if I load back my original styles demo. It's, it's more conceptual different than a practical, than a practical different. Here, oh, let me get this back to the default, the default color. So here I have some gray, a gray label, and some black text. Okay, looks fine. Now we run this application, and we pick a dark style, a style with a dark uh, background, for example, Ruby Graffiti, and see what happens. The label was black, but in the style with the black background has a white color. The text, which is not styled, is black on black and becomes hardly visible. So again, the two are identical to all technical purposes, but the difference that the label adapts to the user's style, to the color that the user has picked, if the style is written properly, the text will never adapt. You should manually say, hey, text color is now is now white, and and so that's that's a bit uh, that's a bit um, confusing. Uh, now the reason you don't get full control for the uh, graphical elements for the um, for the text is that you get exposed a higher level of properties uh, such as color that are specific to that individual control. All right. Um, this question has to deal with multiple effects, um, and I believe that is not supported. The question is, if we apply a glow effect and a reflection effect to a button, the glow effect will not show up. Why is that? Um, if I remember, and I might get a bit confused, um, if I remember at the very beginning, you could apply like a bunch of styles, a, a bunch of effects, and they will somehow all get applied. And the final output was some completely distorted images. So at one point, uh, again from the outside, because I again stopped working very recently <laughs> for Macadero, but the impression I had from the outside is that they decided to put some rules on the things you could do and you couldn't do. Like there are some effects you cannot apply to some controls when they really make no sense and create a very kind of nonsense UI. And you cannot apply multiple styles. It's try to make some, I mean, to put some limitations on what users can do in terms of well, avoiding some, some nonsense behaviors. But again, I'm not 100% sure about uh, either the technical details or, or the decision behind these details. Yeah, I think you're on the right track. There's no way of uh, figuring out exactly how do you want uh, multiple effects to be applied, in what order should they be applied, etc. There's no way of specifying that. So I think that yeah, was... and rather than having a completely garbage, uh, gar I mean garbage on the screen, it, it, you kind of pick one, and 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 that's it, and everything else is is kind of discarded. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, there was a question if. FireMonkey was the equivalent to uh, Visual Studio, and I said no. Uh, FireMonkey is uh, Embarcadero's uh, 
uh, business application uh, f uh, platform or framework, if you will. Uh, the follow-up questions from that is, is FireMonkey roughly equal to WPF with XAML, or is it uh, roughly equal to Microsoft Expression Blend? Uh, I'd say it has, I, I won't say it's equal, but it has some relationship with Silverlight or WPF. I mean, it, they are, the two are kind of twins. Well, they have differences, of course. Uh, I tend to say more Silverlight because Silverlight originally had the idea of being cross-platform, not that Microsoft didn't, did, didn't really went through it. Uh, the relationship is in the fact that they both use the uh, GPU for optimized output, so the code is not um, it's not painted by going through the like native controls like buttons and edits and and, and so on but it's painted in a completely graphical way with lots of flexibility in the UI development process. And that's true for Silverlight or WPF, and it's also true for, for FireMonkey. Uh, FireMonkey was built to be cross-platform, and given that the Mercadero has no platform agenda, it is going to be increasingly <laughs> cross-platform, meaning we're going to hit uh, more and more platforms. So I'll run out works very nicely on, on Windows and Mac. Uh, but of, as most of you know, the goal is to move it to, to the mobile world as well. Um, but it, it has relationship. Now, technically, it's not based on the same exact model with XAML, but it, there are relationships. I mean, DFM is kind of an older version uh, of what XAML uh, eventually ended up into. XAML has more graphical appeal, is more supposed to be designed and created by a graphic designer. I'm not, not sure if this promise was really fulfilled. Um, we don't have such a, such a claim, but it, certainly a designer could work on stars without really being an application developer. So there are areas of the product that allow some uh, flexibility in terms of the, the application look and feel. So and, well, the other big thing uh, sorry, which is very different though in terms of management and deployment when you think about WPF of, of Silverlight or well, Flash to, to name another product that somehow is in that area, you have, it's, it's, it's kind of a closed system, yeah you have some way access to some source code, here we get full source code, and also you are forced to install the library on the platform and then you can run your application only if the library is there. For WPF that's big because it requires I mean, a modern version of, of uh, Windows with all the WPF, um, with all of the .NET architecture, so the light is a little smaller but still there is a footprint and there is an installation process to go through. With FireMonkey you can use runtime packages but you can also compile everything into your executable and this makes it not only nicer and easier to deploy on Windows and Mac, which is good, but maybe not critical, but it makes it much easier to deploy to uh, iOS and Android, uh, where th there is not just an option at times, uh, specifically on iOS, you can actually deploy a runtime engine. This is something uh, Apple doesn't allow. Yeah. So here's a, a slightly off-topic uh, question, but um, maybe you're aware of it. It was not possible to create VCL components uh, in C++ that could be reused in Delphi. You could only do the opposite. You can only create components in Delphi if you wanted to work in both C++ and Delphi. Is that still true for FireMonkey? Do you know? I, as far as I know, it is still true. It might be, but just don't take it as a promise. Okay, no problem. It might be that going forward, uh, as the the two environments will start sharing some of the compiler backend uh, in terms of LLVM, things might change in the future. But for today, I mean, specifically on the Windows platform, this is this is still the case. Okay, so you may want to repeat that question um, tomorrow when we have some uh, live R and D discussions as well. Uh, Robert. Oh, yeah, good point. Uh, let's see. Um, is there an equivalent component in FireMonkey for the VCL uh, T-list view? Uh, no, there isn't anything like that because that's a native Windows uh, component. However, 
Uh, what you might have noticed, although my demo is really pointing to that, is that list boxes are quite flexible. Each list box item can have any sub element, so you can have list box item with multiple um, text element with text and graphic, and different lines can also have different structure. So not only you can have structure, but structure could be line specific. Of course, you can also use um, um, a, a grid, but the grid is more is more strict in what you put inside the grid elements. It's more regular. With with list boxes, you really gain a lot of uh, of flexibility. Having said said that, it would be nice to have kind of a ready to use uh, T list view, but it's not there. Okay. Uh, he says uh, list boxes in FireMonkey don't allow sub items like T list view. Um, well, that's correct. Like Marco was saying, you can you can parent any. Uh, control in any of the items in the list view, and then you can parent any other controls in those controls. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly uh, the idea. Uh, I can actually, I can do it in a second. I can add a list box item to this demo. Oh, I already picked a complex item or a simple item, and you can make this bigger, and then you can supposedly. Uh, take, uh, oops, sorry, and oh, I can type. Um, you can take an image and put it inside a, a list box item. So it's completely flexible. You can really do whatever you want. Now, again, list view provides some structure, which is nice, but you can really create your, I mean, this has a bunch of text element. This has text and image. It's completely uh, flexible. You can do it in code, of course. You can do it at the design time. Um, completely up to you. Okay, John Strong is asking: Is there a tutorial for this in C++? Well, uh, this will be uh, this will serve as a uh, tutorial, uh, quick tutorial uh, as a replay. But is, is there any other rep um, any other documentation on this? Uh, how to do this in C++? Um, exactly on a topic like styles, no reason and. Not that this makes things better, but I know that at C++, at times C++ developers feel a little cut out, but there isn't even in Delphi, so <laughs> it's still they are on par. Uh, I'm, I have material written that I plan releasing sooner or later, but uh, would have been sooner if I had an, uh, um, switched job and, and started working for my career, and I'm a little busy, but I'll get some material on, on styles out uh, as soon as I can. Okay, great. Sounds good. Um, the follow-up question on the t-text versus t-label. Can we gain access to the uh, paint of t-text to apply gradients and strokes? Uh, I, what I'd suggest doing probably in this case is create, um, is inherit from t-text and create a custom control. Um, and the custom control has full support for um, fill and strokes, and at that point, you can just go for it. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've been hit by that issue. I mean, I had code that didn't work anymore in XC3, so I, I, I see, I've seen that, that problem. But um, ultimately, they made text more text and not just do everything, including text. But you can cast, create your own, either inherit from T-shape directly or inherit from text and, and provides extra behavior. Uh, that's what I'd suggest without having really looked into it uh, in detail. All right, great. There are no more questions at this point, and it is 6.57 in the Scotts Valley studio. So uh, anything, uh, anything you want to add to your uh, uh, very nice presentation here on C++ uh, FireMonkey Wood Style? Uh, no, nothing, nothing, um, nothing specific. Just uh, well, I'm not directly. I mean, strictly involved with C++ Builder, but if you have any question or issue, feel free to get in touch. Uh, I can at least redirect your your request to the, the the appropriate people. And I, I mean, I had some past experience with C++, so I can at least understand some of the code and have like some knowledge uh, of the language. Uh, again, I'm more focused on Delphi in, in terms of Rod Studio, but it's the two th tools are so strictly related that ultimately I'm trying to follow also what's happening on the C++ beta side. 
Mm -hmm. And um, for the two people that have now asked for a tutorial on on styles and controls and stuff like that, I strongly suggest the very next session, which is going to be creating custom FireMonkey controls with C++ Builder XC3 by Ray Knopka. So stay tuned for that in just a few minutes. Again, thank you very much, Marco. Thanks a lot. Bye.